Well, I am so glad that you have joined us today. And can I tell you, I cannot wait to be able to gather with you in worship. I miss seeing you. I miss hearing you lift your voice in worship. I miss seeing hands raised. I miss hearing your laugh. I miss seeing your tears when God moves in your life during the message. I have some exciting news that I'm going to share with you at the close of the sermon today. Now, trust me, you are going to want to stick around. Don't X out. Now, if you need to go grab a cup of coffee, get something to drink, go do it. But come right back because we have some big news to share. Now, if there are kids in the room, I want to ask you to do me a favor. I know it can be so difficult to stay engaged. You guys have been doing school all day long on Zoom, staring at a screen. You stare at screens uh, afterwards when you watch TV. You're tired of being in the house. So here's a coloring challenge for you. Today, kids, the sermon comes from Luke chapter 8, 22 through 25. Would you draw a picture of Jesus standing up in a boat and calming the wind and the, wa and the waves? This is an amazing story. The waves and the wind are rocking back and forth. They're rocking the boat. The disciples are scared. Jesus is sound asleep in the bottom of the boat until his disciples wake him up. So go grab your crayons, your colored pencils and markers and draw a picture of Jesus calming the storm. Parents, we want to see those pictures. So snap a photo, upload it to your social media page and use the hashtags CalvaryAZ and hashtag impossible. Today we continue in our sermon series, Impossible. We are going to be in Luke chapter 8, verses 22 through 25. The scripture passage will be on the screen. Now at this point, when we get to this point in this passage of scripture, at this point in the life of Jesus, Jesus had 12 men who were devoted to him. Uh, these 12 men had decided to follow Jesus. They had walked away from their occupations and they individually made the choice to follow Jesus. Now, I know it sounds and it may sound a little elementary, but a follower of Jesus follows Jesus. Whoa, Pastor Joe, that's profound, right? If I'm a Christ follower, that means I follow Jesus. Now, I have trusted Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I've turned away from my old life of sin and I've begun to follow Jesus. That's because I've experienced the life change. So it means I try to live the way Jesus says to live. I try to become more like Jesus. In today's passage, Jesus is going to sound a little frustrated with his followers because they were not following Jesus. Him. So let's read together Luke chapter 8, verse 22. One day he got into a boat with his disciples and he said to them, let us go across to the other side of the lake. So they set out and as they sailed, he fell asleep and a windstorm came down on the lake and they were filling with water and were in danger. And they went and woke him saying, master, master, we are perishing. And he awoke and rebuked the wind and the raging waves and they ceased and there was calm. He said to them, where is your faith? And they were afraid and they marveled saying to one another, who then is this that he commands even winds and water and they obey him? Did you hear the frustration in Jesus voice? He was asleep. The disciples were scared. They woke him up, not because they trusted him, but because they were afraid. See, they were being controlled by fear and not faith. So what would you do if you were in a freak windstorm on the lake? What if you were out in a rowboat without life jackets and while the wind was raging around you, the boat began filling up with water? Would it be scary? Would you fear for your life? Well, that is how these disciples felt. They were afraid and they felt powerless. They felt like the only one who could help them out of their problem was Jesus. Now, 
you and I have probably never been in a freak storm on the lake like this. So how do we apply this passage of scripture to our lives? Well, we both know we have been through many storms in our lives that have been scary. For instance, one storm my wife and I experienced was a storm that lasted for about six years, six years of infertility, six years of trying to have a baby followed by a miscarriage. That was a storm that hurt. That was a storm that frightened us. Another storm that my family experienced was a, a storm when I was suddenly fired from a church in Virginia as their lead pastor after seven weeks when I learned about financial corruption in the church. I didn't know what to do. Christy and I didn't know what to do. We didn't know how to move forward. It was a storm that seemed to, uh, that could have paralyzed us because of fear. Are you presently in a storm? I mean, besides the COVID-19 storm, is there another storm that you're going through that is shaking you to the core? And if so, I have great news for you. The truth is storms are painful experiences that will end. See, storms of life have the ability to rip into our hearts and shred our lives. Storms of life can cause deep pain that changes the way we think and how we act. In my college days, a tornado uh, ripped through our college campus and wrecked it. Classroom buildings collapsed, art was destroyed. The entire landscape of the campus changed, but when it was rebuilt, it was better than ever. Now, I know it feels like the COVID-19 storm has been dragging on and on and on, but it will end. It has been painful, but it will end. Say that out loud with me right now. This storm will end. Say it with me. This storm will end. Now say it like you mean it. This storm will end. And that's the great thing about storms. They have a beginning, but they also have an end. And there's going to be a day when we come back and we gather together as a church, this COVID-19 storm will end. But what about those other storms? What about the other storms that we face in our lives that aren't COVID-19? Well, first I, I want to talk about their root causes. I think there are root, there are three root causes of storms that we all face in our lives. And these are the three root causes. We face storms because we live in a broken world. We face storms because of our own sinful nature. And we face storms because of spiritual attack. Now, some of the storms we face in our lives come from the reality that we live in a broken world. We live in a world that sin broke. We have wars and viruses, diseases, infertility, cancers, accidents, injuries, because we live in a world that sin broke. It was not supposed to be like this. After God created the world, he looked around and said it was all good. Then Adam and Eve sinned and the entire world world broke. Now that leads to the second cause of storms in our lives, our sinful nature. If I could be honest with you, some of the storms that I face in my life are brought about by me. I am the creator of the storm. See, I am a sinner. I've done stupid things that have caused storms in my own life. The first two and a half years of marriage was a storm in my marriage because I was selfish. I wanted my own way. I caused the storm. I created the storm. Our sinful nature can create storms that can create fear and hurt and, and, and loneliness in our lives. And the final root cause of storms that we face in life is spiritual attack. See, if you're a follower of Jesus, God loves you 
unconditionally. He is for you. God wants you to be to prosper, to be blessed, and God rejoices over you. He loved you enough to send his son to die on the cross for you. And guess what that means? If God loves you, you can be sure the devil, Satan, hates your guts. He hates you because God loves you. He hates you because he is a God hater. And as followers of Jesus, some of the storms we face in life should be categorized as spiritual warfare. The devil wants to destroy the work of God in your life. The devil wants to ruin your story of life change. So that's the three root causes of storms. Some storms come through a broken world. Uh, some storms come from uh, our own sinful nature and other storms come through spiritual attack. Now, I share that with you to say, I can do a pretty good job of identifying when I create a storm in my own life because of my own idiotic sinful nature but I can't really distinguish between storms caused by a broken world or storms caused by spiritual warfare. And the great thing is I don't really have to. It really does not matter the cause of the storm. If I'm being attacked in spiritual warfare or if it's because of my, uh, because of we live in a broken world, but it does matter how you and I answer the question that Jesus asked seemingly out of frustration to his followers when we're in the middle of that storm. Jesus asked the disciples, where is your faith? Now, how would you feel if you were going through a storm in life like a cancer diagnosis and somebody said to you, just have faith or where is your faith? It would, be, it would come across trite. It would come across uncaring. When I read this passage, it sounds like Jesus was suggesting the reason why they were experiencing fear and panic is their own fault. That things would get better if they only believed more. Where is your faith? What would that question communicate to you? What was it precisely that Jesus expected the disciples to do. Now, I know this is gonna sound impossible, but I believe that Jesus asked, where is your faith to the disciples? Because he was a little frustrated that they did not demonstrate faith. Jesus believed that through faith, the disciples could have calmed the wind and the waves. Remember the first point that I talked about, a follower of Jesus follows Jesus. The whole role of being a disciple is to learn from the teacher and begin to put into practice what we learn. Building up to this story, Jesus had emphasized over and over and over again to his disciples that a follower of Jesus does what he tells them to do. Jesus connects faith with action. Look at what he had been teaching his disciples up until this point in the story. In Luke 6, 46, Jesus said, why do you keep calling me Lord, Lord, when you don't do what I say? Luke 6, 49, Jesus said, but anyone who hears and doesn't obey is like a person who builds a house without a foundation. Luke 8, 18, Jesus said, so pay attention to how you hear. To those who listen to my teaching, more understanding will be given. And then finally in Luke 8, 21, Jesus said, my mother and brothers are all those who hear God's word and obey it. Right up until this point, Jesus has been connecting faith with action, faith with obedience. See, it's one thing to say that you and I are followers of Jesus. Do we really follow him? Do we really put into practice his teaching to our lives? If we don't obey, the Bible was clear on this, then our faith is not real. Real faith is action. Jesus asked, where is your faith? Because his followers 
could have calmed the storm themselves. See, this was their moment to put into practice all the things that Jesus had been teaching them. This was their moment to face their storm by faith. This was their moment to exercise faith, to stand up in the boat and rebuke the wind and the waves. But instead, they chose to be controlled by fear. Now, honestly, the actions that they took look a lot like me. I find myself in a storm. I find myself in a bad situation. I cry out to Jesus to help me. How do you act in the middle of a storm? Do you allow fear to overwhelm you? See, today, are you allowing fear to control your behavior? Are you allowing fear over COVID-19 to control your attitude and your actions? Now, I want to invite you to do what the disciples did not do. During the storm, show others your faith. See, other people need you to practice your faith. Right after this story, right after Luke chapter 8 and Luke chapter 9 and Luke chapter 10, Jesus sent out his disciples to practice their faith. He sent out his disciples to heal other people, to heal people of diseases, to cast out demons. And they went out and they worked miracles by faith for other people. Not one time throughout all of scripture do we ever see a follower of Jesus work a miracle for themselves. When you and I walk through storms and our faith is active, Other people are inspired, they are encouraged, and they are challenged about what they really believe about Jesus. Now, maybe this storm of COVID-19, maybe it's kind of helped expose some regret that you might have about not acting out your faith. Maybe before COVID-19, you never connected with a life group. You always wanted to, you always wanted to get involved, you always wanted to get engaged but you didn't, and now you feel lonelier than ever. Maybe you've not had a life group to connect with over Zoom or over Facebook, and you feel like you're in a boat alone. Maybe you have regret that you've never signed up to serve in children's ministry and student ministry on our first impressions team, and you regret that you've not acted out your faith. See, I want you to understand that when these doors open back up, you have a place to exercise and to practice your faith every week, every single day. From celebrate recovery, uh, grief share, serving in local missions, even when we are not in a storm, followers of Jesus practice our faith for other people. So I want to encourage you to do something. If you are in a storm or not in a storm, but you are inspired to begin to practice your faith, I want you to reach out to us online, talk to one of our chat hosts, tell them how you want to get involved. Because Jesus teaches us that faith is active, not only that faith can be, should be seen, but also that faith is powerful. In Matthew 17, 20, Jesus said these words when he described faith. Jesus taught faith was powerful. He said this, I tell you the truth. If you had faith, even as small as a mustard seed, you could say to this mountain, move from here to there and it would move. Nothing would be impossible. So where is your faith? Can others see your faith by what you do? Is your faith visible to other people? That's what faith is for. Our faith calls us to be active. Our faith calls us to be engaged with a hurting world. Our faith that God has called us to, our faith that God has birthed in our hearts is not 
just for you and I to be forgiven for our sins and experience a, a close relationship with Jesus. Our faith is called to be active, whether we're in the storm or not in the storm. Can other people see your faith? See, here's what I want you to understand. God loves you. And the faith that you have in God is not just for yourself, but the faith that you have in God as you have trusted it in Him, God calls you to love others and to serve others. I want to invite you to pray with me. Is your faith as active as you think it ought to be? When you hear those words, where is your faith? Is there enough evidence of your life that can prove to other people that you are a follower of Jesus? Can they look at your actions and say, wow, that person must love God. That person must have faith in Jesus. God calls followers of Jesus to actively love others and serve him. Do you feel like your faith can be proven to others through how you've lived your life? I, I want to invite you and I want to confess, I don't think that my faith is as active as it should be. When I'm in the middle of a storm, or when I'm in the middle of preparing a sermon, I often hear the words of Jesus echo back to me that says, where is your faith? Let's trust Jesus, but then let's also make sure that we are active and we're demonstrating to the world that our faith is in the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Let's pray together. Father, we want to first confess how much we are dependent upon you. We, we can be frightened over storms that come our way. We do call out to you and we do trust in you. But Lord, we also see in this passage of scripture that you have expectations for followers of Jesus to walk boldly by faith. Yes, we call out to you. Yes, we trust in you, but we must also be actively taking steps of faith in our lives. Lord, would you bless my brothers and sisters today that are watching? Would you speak to their hearts about how they need to take action in their faith? Lord, we continue to trust you. We continue to believe in you. We continue to be changed and transformed by you. Help us to love you more. Help us to believe in you more and help us to put our faith into actions. Lord, thank you for loving us. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now, I said at the beginning that I had some great news to share. In two weeks, on May 30th, 31st, we are back. May 30th, and 31st, we will be offering our worship services at our normal times. And we know that many of you will still have concerns about gathering together. So we're going to continue to offer our services online as well. We understand your hesitation and we want you to continue to join us in worship. But beginning May 30th and 31st, that May 30th, Saturday night, we are back. I'm so excited about that. The details were going to be shared this week about what we need you to do to help keep our campus safe. But praise God, we are coming together for worship. Now, let's turn and let's worship together our great King.